All right, friends, we're back with another episode in our unconventional homesteading topic this season. We've covered how to homestead in different phases of life, um, during different age ranges. And today we're taking a little bit of a different angle and approach. We're going to talk about how you can grow food, which is really the essence of homesteading, within your landscaping. And I really, really wanted to talk about this topic in particular. It was one of my top ideas when we started conceptualizing this season, because I am very aware that a lot of you are into the homesteading lifestyle, but you cannot move to the country, or you can't even big move to a bigger lot, potentially. You know, you have your spot, maybe it's in a town or a city, and that's just where you are right now. And it's always been my goal to give you guys options, no matter where you live. And one way that you can do that, even if you can't grow a conventional vegetable garden, is to weave edible landscaping into your yard. So today I have the ultimate edible landscaping guru, Ed Livo, with me today. And he has over 40 years of experience in this field. So I can't wait for this conversation. Welcome, Ed. Happy to have you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so I guess give us a little bit of a, a mental picture of what your personal yard and, and your home is like. I know we had tried to get some pictures up um, for the folks who are watching on video. We couldn't get the technology to work as yeah. usual. It's giving us trouble. So kind of paint that picture for us with words instead. Well, I'll tell you what. I've got an average city lot in California, in Antioch, California, which is in the Bay Area. And uh, I'm kind of uh, snug up against a state park. So I have no neighbors in my backyard. It's very cool. But I had to terrace my entire backyard because it's on the side of a hill. So I have three terraces. And on each one of those terraces, they're broken up into six different segments. And I have a fruit tree segment at the top. I have uh, garden beds at the top. I have a spalliers all along the back fence. I have fruit trees lining the side as, as um, what do you call it? Um, uh, windbreaks or, 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 or uh, privacy screens, if you will, um, on each side of my yard. And then I have, on the next tiers down, I have vegetable garden beds. I have an herb garden that's the focus of my backyard. So right off the pat porch on you know, the patio, you see a full herb garden and then two uh, major beds at the bottom, which are really, really easy, accessible. And, um, and yeah, and that's, and then I've got container trees all over the place. I mulch, I capture about a thousand gallons of water a year off rooftop capture. Um, let's see what else <laughs> yeah, a lot <laughs> yeah um what kind of varieties are you are you i mean you're california so i know you have a, a wide range of possibility what what's your prime primary variety that you're growing well you know i'm california so the, a, a lot i have a lot of citrus you know i've got a i've got a tremendous to be exact all my being that they're evergreen the citrus actually are on the uh, on the perimeter of my yard block blocking out the view of my neighbors i mean i've got full screens that I use for uh, block, you know, for privacy. Uh, mandarins, as a matter of fact, beautiful gold nugget mandarin on one side and a pixie mandarin on the other side and loaded with fruit and, you know, more fruit than we know what to do with. It's almost a problem. Um, then Washington naval oranges up on the side of the hill to block out, you know, the other neighbor. And um, yeah, that's the primary. <clears throat> but I have plenty of deciduous as well because, you know, to, to be perfectly honest, that's my focus is deciduous fruit trees. I'm a, I'm a deciduous fruit tree specialist. And that's what I've been into for the better part of the 40 years is deciduous fruit trees. You know, so I have pomegranates and persimmons and I, uh, let's see, pomegranates, persimmons, figs, um, blueberries, uh, cane berries. I've got, um, let's see, what else? I'm trying to, oh, jujubes. I have grapes. Uh, you get kumquats. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Anyways, I do. I have a lot of different, a lot of different varieties. There's always something ripe here to eat. What is pawpaws. your time? Pawpaws. I have pawpaws. Have pawpaws. Okay. That's, is that a Southern? I don't even, I've never even seen one. I, I, could, a, I would not recognize one if they hit me in the face. Is that a Southern thing or is that all? Eastern, like Eastern and Midwest, Midwestern. And it, uh, you know, it, it's an, uh, one of the few fruits that's actually uh, a native. We don't okay. have many fruit varieties that are actually native. 
and uh, papas are. Uh, and they're in the. What else would be native to the U.S.? Um, not much. Blueberries, blueberries. Blueberries. Yeah, cranberries. Cranberries. Yeah. Yeah, everything else is introduced. People would be really surprised surprised to know that plums are not native to the United States. They're introduced. Okay, so I'm on, a, I'm on a, a history rabbit trail. Sorry, this is my brain works. I like this stuff. Um, where when did we start seeing like the majority of the fruit coming over? I mean, I'm sure it depends. Was that like with Spanish explorers? Was that with the like pilgrims? Like when when did that start being introduced? Well, I don't think much came over with the pilgrims to be, you know, to tell you the truth. I don't know what they were, what they brought. So I've never, ever explored that. I'd say most of it probably came in with the uh, missions. The original missions um, brought in many of the, you know, the pomegranates and the figs and the um, grapes um, originally that came into the country probably came in with the missions. Um, Then... um, then, of course, as the settlers started to come in from Europe in the 16 and 1700s, um, a lot of varieties came in during that time. But the, a lot of varieties came in in the 1800s because everybody was searching for what did well in the United States because we had all these people settling and, you know, the all these different nationalities coming in from everywhere. Everybody wanted their favorite variety of fruit. And uh, so you had to test it. And that's where where we got the USDA from, because a lot of it was brought in by people that the government sent out worldwide to try to find varieties that would do well here, because we were looking for a commercial angle in the 1800s as well. So there was an explosion of fruit development that went on between, you know, probably around the 1830s to probably the beginning of the 1900s. It's fascinating, huge, fascinating history. That's far more recent than I would have thought. I mean, you're, you're really, it became, it sounded like industrial revolution as everything else was popping. That was really starting to be, yeah, I thought it was way earlier than that. Well, it, you know, like, 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 let's say uh, people like Jefferson, you know, he brought back lots of different varieties of fruit when he traveled into Europe, he figs, especially there was a number of different varieties of figs that Jefferson brought back. So in the 1700s, you know, the settlers on the East coast, which were primarily, of course, you know, European settlers really did bring in a lot of their, you know, personal varieties. But the explosion didn't happen, I think, until in the early 1800s. Then then it really went crazy because we were moving more westward. There was a lot more people here. And as the populations grew, the demand for, you know, quantity grew, as well as, you know, of course, specific varieties that people could, you know, um, be, uh, kind of um, associate with, you know, the varieties that they grew up with, varieties that they, they they thought were great. That's fascinating. I guess I always had this very incorrect image of the first, you know, Europeans to hit California. They were met with <laughs> citrus trees everywhere, but that is not the case. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no actually, uh, actually uh, citrus probably was la- a little later. You know, I mean, I think the Washington Naval Orange was first introduced into Florida and it failed in Florida. It didn't do well in Florida. And, uh, you know, the Washington Naval Orange isn't named after Washington State. It's named after Washington, D.C., because that's that's where it got out to California was through a woman that was, I believe her husband worked for the USDA at the time, and this citrus that failed in Florida, she said, well, you know, I'd like to try it in California. And she brought it to California, and that changed the citrus industry, you know, in in the United States overnight. It became the the lead variety. That's so cool. (laughs) Um, <laughs> it is cool. okay sorry i i just love that stuff i love knowing where where we got the things that we consider so normal like where did they start and why did they oh, start so, yeah so do i yeah, so do I. I, yeah. I do too so okay that brings us full circle to your your california citrus that you currently have growing you said you have a lot and sometimes it's a problem on what to do with it all so what do you do with it all well i mean we do all kinds of things i mean like for instance right now we're picking all the remainder of the mandarins the pixie mandarin for this year and all the rest of the washington naval darns they're kind of dry but they still have lots of flavor um so you know i mean i'm pretty much giving out the remainder to friends um uh, during the season it's citrus is tough uh lemons we have lots of lemons and we take lemons and make ice cubes out of them and then put those in the freezer and then during the summertime you know we enjoy 
you know, uh, lemon ice cubes in our tea or in our, our, our water and stuff. It's really an, 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 a, a cool way to, to enjoy that, uh, that citrus. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. Good question. I give away a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, and this is kind of, I guess, a question based on your knowledge of working throughout the United States and, you know, all the different climates. Mm -hmm. When you recommend or you give advice for someone to start their own edible landscaping adventure, are you looking at primarily like perennials or annuals for that sort of thing? Um, you know, being that I'm a fruit tree specialist, I, I really come from fruit. I start, you know, that you, you really want to knock on my door and say, Hey, what kind of fruit variety should I plant here? Um, perennial wise, I'm into beneficial insects. I'm into definitely, you know, companion planting of, of, of plants to attract beneficial insects to the garden. And so that's a real, real important thing as well. So, but that's almost comes after you decide what you want to plant and then, choose the varieties of plants that you're going to bring in that att attract your beneficials. So um, I think in that order, you know, more over. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. What, I'm just kind of thinking of the type of questions. Oh, but, but I should say this, I should also say, I'm really into blending. Um, I, I'm really into blending. Like when you say annuals, you mean like vegetables. Yeah. Or, I, yeah. I, yeah. I'm into blending vegetable. I mean, I've got, my, my landscape is really a blended kind of thing. I, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a woman named Rosalind Creasing. Um, she actually coined the phrase edible landscape. Oh, so okay. edible landscape was not a phrase until Rosalind Creasy wrote the book on edible landscaping. Uh, Rosalind Creasy is a dear friend of mine. And, uh, and I thought that I was, I thought I really had it down for edible landscaping in 1978, let's say. And then a friend of mine in 1979 gave me for my birthday, I think 79 or 80, gave me, gave me for my birthday, Roz's book. Oh my gosh. I went, I'm a nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I would recommend that, you know, people who are into edible landscaping, really combining edibles with, you know, wonderful annuals and perennials, um, really research Rosalind Creasy. She's um, a, a, a wonderful resource and she's got some absolutely just wonderful books. They're, they're top. Awesome. And are they, is, is you said the ones called animal edible landscaping, like that's the title. Sure. sure. Okay. Cool. Want me to get cool. it? I have my, I have it right here in my library. Oh, I mean, we can, <laughs> we'll, we'll post it in the show notes. I'm sure if we can easily grab okay. a link and post it for folks, right. but All right. um, so you said you like to blend. Yeah. Do you have specific reasons for blending other than just, you like the variety of food that you get, or is there something else? No, that? you know, I, I like to, because in edible landscaping, you know, when you're dealing, dealing with a residence like this, you know, really, yeah, it kind of gets kind of boring just to try to lay it out farm style it just doesn't really look it just doesn't jive you know so it's really nice to to appreciate and embrace the the colors and the textures of these different things and then blend them in with you know your your annual flowers or even perennial flowers um and then you know try to make it a, you know a real um expression i mean it's always a challenge too in the edible landscape you get to change it every year, you know, where so many landscapes, you know, people plant a shrub and they plant another shrub and they plant another shrub and boom, that's it. And then they walk away. But in the animal landscape, you get to take and plug in new things and do new things every year, try new combinations. And that's a lot of fun. That really is, to me, that's what made edible landscaping so attractive. It, it's what I embraced was the fact that, you know, I'm a pretty high strung dude, you know, and I, I really want, you know, to, to experiment a lot. So the, you know, the average plug in the shrub and walk away just don't, doesn't work for me. It never has, you know, I want to try different for years. I did different, you know, you, you know, the seed catalog time. Oh yeah. So I now the seed the catalog, thing, right? It's a thing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, get out of my way. I'm, I'm ordering seeds. Right now. Correct, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, every year, you know, and, and a new catalog, new company and, new varieties and you know new disappointments never that again yep yep yeah. gotta try it once so at least it's once. just so much fun you know i mean that's really 
for me, that's what it's all about. It's, it's really about the fun, the pleasure, the rewards. So I, I, was re I was reading something the other day. I don't remember what it was, but it was an interesting thought, and I wanted to ask you about it. They, they had said um, they felt there was some sort of cultural stigma around using edible in edibles and landscaping kind of like it always has been it's why terrible. is that like why is that it's so weird there are cities that have ordinance that say you can't plant a garden in the front yard and if a neighbor wants to complain about whatever your garden design is by saying you got too much edible in there you know they can actually have you tear it out it's terrible the, um, in the state of California, there was actually an ordinance in Sacramento, in the capital of, of California, that actually addressed that. And then there was a court case that actually uh, addressed that. And the court said, you don't have any right to do that at all, period. You know? So I, I think that there is a stigma. It, it continues. But I think that one of the things that you have to appreciate you know, when, when you talk about that is you have to say, you can't just plug in, you know, a garden in your front yard and expect your neighbors to appreciate you for that. So you have to have a certain amount of appreciation for the fact that, you know, th they're right. You know, that's what edible landscaping is all about. If you, go, if you plug it in and make it a part of, like right outside my window here, I have a beautiful persimmon, the Fuyu persimmon tree. Okay. I don't think any of my neighbors have any problems other than try to keep their hands off it when it's got, when it's full of fruit. And it sits right outside my office here. And you don't know how often I sit here and I watch somebody walk up, stare at it and walk right up to it with yeah. me sitting here in the, office, here in the office and pull a, pine, pull a fruit, fruit off, off of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Irresistible. So yeah. I think it's how you approach edible landscaping in your, you know, in your, in your yard. So if you're in a residential, you've got plenty of land and stuff, then you do it traditionally. But you don't have to, but you can do it traditionally. But when you've got a residential neighborhood or, or yard, you really have to take into account, you know, what um, what enhances and sustains the value of everybody else's investments as well. So I think you, you really have to, there's a compromise. And if I spend time out here to try to take and make it look beautiful and functional at the same time, and somebody wants to argue that I'm prepared to argue that if I just willy-nilly go out there and don't pay any attention to what my neighbor's considerations would be, then I probably am setting myself up for, you know, somebody to complain. Sure. Absolutely. So you got to be a good advocate for the idea and the lifestyle if you're going to be doing this in a, in a urban or Correct. a suburban setting. Correct. I think people appreciate that. You know, like the, the, even the ones who may not have tolerance, if they see that you're taking the time and doing something that maybe they're not into, but they, they can't deny the fact that, you know, it isn't uh, obtrusive. You know, it actually is attractive. Yeah, they're cool. So, so, how do, so give us some tips for design. So if someone's listening to this episode, they've never thought about this before. They have a big old front yard with some grass and nothing else. Yeah. How would you give, give them that inspiration to start doing this in an, in an attractive way that would make the neighbors happy? Well, the easiest way to start out, if you're going to do a front yard garden, the easiest way to start out is, is taking the old simple perennial, you know, approach and, and doing islands, you know, just doing, you know, uh, divide yourself out islands in your yard and then make those planter areas. Okay. And then, you know, work with combinations of vegetables. Like, you know, remember, you know, cucumbers and zucchinis and things like that. They're beautiful foliage, great flowers on them, you know, and if you think about them, not in the context of a vegetable, but as a, you know, a beautiful annual plant in the garden, then what do you plant to, you know, to, um, to, to actually complement, you know, that, that appeal in the garden, the textures are great. Cucumbers grow almost flat on the ground. So they make a great ground cover, you know, and, and they do just fine, you know. So, I mean, it, it's that. I think the only, the only plant that I've never, ever really been able to figure out how to it, um, incorporate into a front yard is corn. Uh, uh, corn just oh, almost, yeah. it's almost a standout. You know what I mean? Yes. You know, if, if somebody's going to complain, they're going to be, hey, the guy's growing corn yeah, in his front yard, yard for crying out loud. And Hard it, to hide the corn. 
it's so vertical, you know, and yeah. so it looks like it belongs in rows. You can't totally. hide that. You cannot hide that. Is a good point. I never thought of that. I mean, that would be obvious if you're trying to be sneaky. Don't do the corn. <laughs> yeah, but I have seen it pulled off. Like people put it on the side of their yard. Like I use citrus as a screen. People put corn up on the side of their yard as a screen, and then have that as the backdrop for their garden. I've seen it like where it, it, it like works. You know, you just look at it, and you go, "That's okay." You know, that's yeah. all right. Yeah. They're I more like creative that. than I would be with corn. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's impressive. Um, what about dealing with homeowners associations? I mean, I'm assuming if you're, if you're just making islands, like you're describing, I have a hard time seeing anyone having a trouble with that. What if you have someone who just has a really sticky HOA? Boy, you know what? I, I've actually lectured to HOAs. You know, I've been invited to lecture at many HOAs um, over the years. Um, typically, I think what they like most about what I have to say is that I'm really big on high density pruning and high density planting. So I'm a pruner. You know, I recommend no fruit trees get any taller than you are with your hands extended above your head. HOAs love that. You know, they really don't want any trees growing any taller than their fences. And, you know, my approach was always to keep trees, well, I mean, in the early years of all my R&D, I kept trees at 40 to 48 inches tall just just to be excessively making a fact you know, or making a point that you can maintain trees that short, get a, get a tremendous production out of them, and then enjoy all these other benefits from maintaining your tree low like that. And it didn't have to be on any stinking semi-dwarf rootstock, which semi-dwarf is just a, that's a, a marketing term more than it really is an application. Okay. I was reading something else that said that the other day. I didn't realize there was a thing about the, the dwarf, the semi-dwarf stuff, but it's not well, yes. like well-loved. With no, it should, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, and maybe that's just because people are getting, you know, more educated, more in tune with the fact that, you know, like if I say a rootstock dwarfs 60% of standard, that's fine. But if standard is 40 feet tall, what kind of dwarf is that? <laughs> it sounds great, but in application. And that's a Gravenstein apple. Gravenstein apples are enormous trees. And if you put them on a dwarfing rootstock that let's say like an M7 that dwarfs 65% of standard, you're going to get a tree that's going to be over 20 feet tall. I mean, that's just not, that's, that's not, sem, that's not dwarf. That's not even semi dwarf. Yeah. That's, that's semi loco. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So going back to what you were saying about HOAs, I didn't know this. They, they want shorter trees. Like that's a thing. Like that's, Mm -hmm. That's a common oh, yeah. thing. Yeah, but especially fruit, especially fruit trees. They, they don't want big fruit trees in their backyard. They that's that's if there's any problem with HOAs, it's HOAs. I, oh, pardon me. I mean, I mean, <laughs> the the fact is is that if anybody's going to tell me how to what I can grow and how I can grow it, I probably don't want to be a part of that community anyways. But there are people that choose to live in those kind of communities and still have a desire to grow you know, things and enjoy, you know, the bounty of their, of their property. And so there is applications that you can do. And that's how I got invited into the HOAs is because people who wanted fruit trees said, Hey, get this guy. Cause he's telling us how to keep trees in here and he'll teach you how to tolerate that. To tolerate that. <laughs> such a, such a funny mindset. <laughs> but, it is a yeah, funny mindset. It that's is. right. I, I mean, whenever I go to town, if I had to live in town, I would want to live in the neighborhood with the tallest tree. Like I love big giant old trees, but oh, I didn't so realize I. I didn't realize oh. that was a thing. So I guess if you have to have short trees, fruit trees can still work. Now, now we yeah. Have, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, in my yard, none of my fruit trees in my yard are any taller than eight feet. Which I'm and sure makes it easier for you to 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 harvest and such. Oh, well, harvest, prune, you know, um, any kind of spray that may may need to be applied is is you know keep in mind. You know, big, big trees and spray to me don't go together. You know, if you have to spray a tree, you're using, typically, you're using a chemical of some sort that has a level of toxicity, whatever it may be. You don't want to be just spraying it willy-nilly. You want to take and have all the control you possibly can. And a smaller tree gives you that much more control over, you know, the, the maintenance requirements that go along with all fruit trees. You know, there's no such thing as semi-dwarf makes for a low maintenance tree. That's the, a misconception on the part 
of consumers. Okay. Yes, that makes sense. So what, what type of, of maintenance or, you know, how, how intensive is your daily tasks or your weekly tasks for all of the fruit that you have growing? That's a great question. Um, when you first start out, it's a lot of maintenance, you know, to do it the way I'm doing it. Okay. But what happens, and I'm sure you're already experiencing this because when, when did you start ac actually your homesteading? Uh, 2000 and 2008. Yeah. Didn't you go through that period where you just worked your tail off oh, trying man. to figure yeah. out what you were going to do yep. Yep. or how to do it? Yeah. I don't care what book you had, what guru you had to listen to. You had to experience it yourself totally. and you had to fit it into your own mindset and your lifestyle. And, and that, that's how you do an edible landscape. You know, if you've never done it before, start off with, it's a lot of work. You know, and you would you should plan on that. Even in even this small scale that I have, you know, this is a lot of work to get started out. And and then what happens? What happens as you grow into it? It just, becomes yeah, it feels easier. Yeah, routines. You get routines, yeah. and and some parts of it become you know what you love to do and you look forward to every year, and other things are are a task, and you want to take and make sure that you cut out time for that because it's not necessarily the most you know, the most pleasurable thing that you do, but you got to do it. So I've got that. So now, now I can say, I don't put a lot of time into this at all. To be exact, that was my goal overall. My goal overall is to not be married to my landscape. My goal overall is to enjoy my landscape, you know, and benefit, benefit from, you know, benefit, have it, have it reward me. So it's like anything. I mean, it's hard. There's a learning curve no matter what you're doing. That's new. There is. But once you get through that, then life usually gets yeah. good. Yeah. I, I mean, one of the things I, 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 I have a bad back. I'm not a bad back, but I have a backache right now. And so my son actually came over here on Mother's Day and helped me prune because I prune during the, the spring. I thin and prune at the same time. I have some major pruning that needed to get done. And I just was kind of struggling with it. And so my son came over and, and helped me. It was great. And, uh, and we got it all pruned up and it looks great now. It's very cool. And I took some pictures of it to you for, for you today, but you can't see them. But we can't see them. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> so, no, but, but hold on. Just while we're talking about pictures, remind me, because I know you said you have a Facebook group that folks yes. can yeah. find if they want to see your, your setup. So tell us what that's called. Ed, it's Ed, E-D, Able, A-B-L-E, Solutions. And Edible Solutions has just all of the all of the craziness that I I love to share. Um, has lots and lots of different fruit varieties that I bring in from colleagues from special market specialty markets. Um, it's not focused on citrus. It's actually focused on all the things that I really really love. When I find a new variety of fruit, I get real excited. I want to share it with people. I make a video. <laughs> okay, awesome. And that's so that's, and that's folks. That's a Facebook group. So you can find it's that over on Facebook. Yes. Yes. It's, it's, face, it's on Facebook. Edible Solutions. Edible Solutions. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I just had to give a little side plug there so we didn't forget. That's um, great. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. What would you say are the biggest challenges to this type of gardening for someone who's considering getting into it? Biggest challenge. Well, I mean, aside from, you know, here, I think the important thing that people don't realize is that you can have a garden in just about any landscape. You can enjoy edibles in just about any landscape. Um, and there's so many options out there right now. And there's so many wonderful people like yourself online right now. They're sharing concepts and sharing, you know, their experiences and things. So you can go out and you can plug into people that will help you avoid all the you know, the, the pitfalls, let's say. Um, so I think the biggest challenge is this. Don't overdo yourself. Don't, don't overcommit yourself. Grow into it gradually. Because I think people who overcommit themselves end up, you, you know, you can only take so much disappointment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that and, and you don't want it all to be disappointment. You want to, you want to kind of, you know, ease into it. Okay. So yeah. And I tell the same thing to people starting a homestead. I'm like, don't get the milk cow, the chickens, the pigs, the goats, 
and a five acre garden all in the same year because you oh. will hate your life. Like you got to take it in baby steps. Right, right. And that's that, that's the smart way. So that's the biggest challenge is I think people just want to jump in. And I, I get it. You know, I get it. But I, I it's interesting. I had uh, I have two young colleagues um, at uh, Birchall Nursery, where, which I run now, and um they uh, they don't have a lot of exposure to fruit. So I had them out in the orchards yesterday because we're starting to do fruit evaluations. We have enormous orchards where have all these wonderful varieties. And they immediately started tasting these green fruit, or somewhat green fruit. Oh, it's got color. Oh, it's great. Oh my God, this is the best piece of fruit I've ever had in my life. And sooner or later, you know, after we had tasted like 10, they realized, no, that first one wasn't the best. And 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 then all of a sudden after 10, they realized, I don't know if any of these are great. It, you know, so even, even that short exposure changed these two young people's opinions of their own perception of what, you know, fruit could be. Wait till, I, I said, wait until the middle of June. You'll be just going nuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's just something to be said for that experience. You just can't get it in a book. You can no, get some you things from a book, but then you have to go out and do it. It you got to go out and do it. And that's to the point of, you know, easing in, you know, just like, don't, don't get, don't go all in and then get disappointed because of your, your failures are going to be there. The things that aren't going to work are going to be there. You know, really what you want to do is you want to take, make sure that the successes outnumber the, the challenge or the um, disappointments. Yes. Amen. If someone's in a climate, I mean, I would say not many people are similar to me because I live in like the Arctic of the United States. <laughs> where do you <laughs> live? Where, where, where's your place again? We're Southeast Wyoming, which is zone five. It's not horrible, but with the wind and the blizzards and the hail that we get, it's pretty extreme. Are you, you're a, down by uh, Lake, uh, is it Lake, Lake Mead? Uh, no, we're, we're, near, we're near Cheyenne, Wyoming. Oh, Cheyenne. Okay. Cheyenne, okay. Yeah. So we're, I mean, we're on the high plains. So it's high elevation yeah. and it's windy and it's it gets super cold. Um, yeah. So if someone's maybe Midwest, let's say, cause I'm mm -hmm. an, I'm an extreme case, but they're Midwest. They can't do citrus in their front yard or, no. you know, those tropical things. What would, what were, would be some plants that you would point them to, to get started? Oh, I would say plums, you know, plums are really easy. There's a lot of the American plum varieties. Some, some of the American plum varieties, in my opinion, are some of the best plums you can buy. Superior, um, toka, the bubblegum plum. I mean, those two varieties alone to me are two of my favorites. I mean, even above and beyond all of the standard European plums and Japanese plums, toka and, and superior are standouts. Um, and then, you know, plums probably to start out with, then definitely, you know, getting into your cane berries because your cane berries all do well there. I'm sure you have cane berries now, right? Yep, I do. Yep. Yeah, so you want to do those. And then, you know, some of the uh, more hardy blueberries are really, that's a great variety. Now you've got, then you've got all these esoteric varieties of berries that are in there that, you know, I, what are you, are you zone four? We're five. So I can you're, do oh, currants, sur like surface berries, elderberries. There you go. I can do those guys. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And, and those go into zone four too. So those, those are kind of the, those are the, the extreme cold hardy on the other side. That zone five going the other direction, that opens you up to more of the Japanese plums and the European plums. Do you have any European plums at all? I don't. We have one yeah. we have one variety of plum in our windbreak that's called native plum. And yeah. they're not really yeah. they're just like little they're not much cherry cherry plums. Yeah. It's not yeah, really like, for food, it's more just windbreak because that's our yeah, house. Yeah, got it. Or or you know, it feeds the it feeds the birds. Feeds you the know, birds. the birds are yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You want the birds around. Yeah, for sure. Funny, funny thing about birds is that, you know, people want to chase them off. And in our landscape, you know, what I've learned is, you know, birds eat the insects, you know, more than they do the, you know, my fruit. So I'm not really concerned anymore. Absolutely. Yeah, it all works together. We need all of the species. Yeah. 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 I, have, I have tolerance. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now, now, gophers, gophers <laughs> a whole different thing. Gophers. Jeez. Oh, man. Gophers. Have you ever... I, have you ever read Michael Pollan's book, uh, Second Nature, or it's his gardening book? I think it's called Second Nature. Have you read yes. that? Where he talks yes. about the gopher, his like, he's <clears throat> waxing poetic about how we're in one with nature and we're going with, it's like all symbiotic. And then he's like the gopher <laughs> and, he, and he like yeah. wages like scorched earth on the gopher. It, you have to. I mean, there's no other approach. Uh, you know, gophers are 
yeah, gophers are terrible. Or you spend a lot of money up front to make sure that your beds are all gopher, gopher proof. Everything you put in the ground is gopher proof. I mean, that's the other way. I did not do that. I didn't have a gopher in my yard when I came here. Now every gopher in the, I think every gopher in the three counties comes over here to visit my place. Because it's a nice yard. <laughs> it's I know, they love it. It's great. I watched I watch my garlic my just go. Oh, <laughs> oh. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah. bad. Yeah. It's yeah. not good. It's not good. <laughs> okay, so if someone's not tropical, like citrus land, they can still, they still have options. So for some- oh, they have lots of options. Yeah, you bet. I mean, there's there's some there's some cold colder hardy peaches, you know, that you can get into, and they uh, definitely some of the hardier apples. You know, there's some good hardy apple varieties as well that you can get into. A lot of that uh, the apple varieties that are coming out of the University of Minnesota, where the Honeycrisp came from. Um, there's other varieties that they're introducing, you know, regularly, and I get all my friends from colder climates call me up and say, "Oh my gosh, you can't believe this variety! You got to try it." Well, we bring it into California and it aborts all of its fruit as soon as we get the first heat spike. They don't yes. they don't like low humidity. <laughs> they they want high humidity and and uh, they'll take the hotter temperatures, but not yeah, California. No, not in California. I think I think no. it'll be the episode right before this one publishes. But I interviewed a gentleman who wrote, just wrote a book called Cold Hardy Apples. So he, it was a great oh, conversation. Cool. Um, his name's Bob. I don't remember his last name. But anyway, it was a. I, he opened my eyes, and I realized there was a lot more possibility. I had just written it all off. I was like, I can't do any fruit, and it was really enlightening. So it was a great chat. Is your is your challenge mostly wind? It's the wind. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah. what have you done for wind breaks? Um. So we have our. I, I've been trying to plant. So I got some new little baby apple trees that are super hardy this year, and I've been trying to plant them in areas of the yard that are more protected. Um, cool. There's times when I'll leave, when we can get like little fabric windbreaks or pallets and you can put those on the side. Have you tried an Iliagnus windbreak? I have not. What is yeah. that? Iliagnus is a, a shrub. Um, I, I don't know if it's, I, I don't know if it's kosher to even say Iliagnus anymore, but it, in the real, real cold climates, they used it as a snow break for years. Um, and even, you know, when it's, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, foli when it's foliated, it makes an excellent diffusion for wind. Okay. And it's I'll have tough. To look into that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's Eliagnus angustifolia. Okay. We yeah. have we have a well our conservation district put in we have windbreaks along the north and west sides of our property, which is really common for properties out here. So we have like native yeah. plums, lilacs, and some pines out there. And then we yeah. have our yard, which is even more sheltered. So I'm just trying to build layers of shelter and then put the fruit That's trees cool. kind of in the middle. That, but, That's the way to do it. That's the way awesome. to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah just yeah. diffusing the wind actually helps a whole bunch. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be a wind break if you're actually just pushing the wind into different directions, you know, or just breaking the wind up. That that really makes a big, big difference. I can see that. It's, yeah, it just gets violent. And the other problem we have is we will get, like right now it's, 75 degrees outside it's beautiful it's sunny and things start to leaf out and wake up yes. and then we get a nasty cold snap you know like the following weekend it freezes everything off and so we've had winters where there's old trees like 100 year old trees that can't like it they, they get all happy and then it freezes them and they're done so that did you have that rough. did you have that this year we didn't have it this year not not this year or last year but we've had it in years past idaho had it this year idaho and utah had it this year it's devastating. Everything leafed out, poof, yeah. got hit by the cold. And yeah, yeah. I mean, there's going to be a lot of unhappy peach growers up on the shelf there in Colorado because yeah. they all got hit with it too. It's, it's I'm brutal. surprised it's, it didn't hit you. You're in lower Wyoming. That's right there. Yeah, I am too. Um, it's funny, the trees, you know, the, the trees that have been around for a while, because like right now I have some, probably some people would call them trash trees, but to me, they're, they're great because they grow. The locusts, yeah. like our honey locusts, they don't have leaves sure. yet. Everything else is like, oh, we're coming, we're coming. And the honey locust is like, no, we're waiting till June 1st. And I'm like, that's why you survived, honey locust. That's, <laughs> that's a more intelligent plant. I like Way it. more intelligent. So I've like given up yeah. on the others. I'm like, eh, we're just going to go with the trashy stuff that grows. So Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I like what works. <laughs> I, I always used to say, I, I always used to say that like, um, you, you, you never, like, for instance, I, I don't amend soil, you know, when you plant a tree because, you know, you amend the soil and then the tree actually becomes real, you know, happy with the amended soil. It doesn't want to go into the native soil. 
So I quit amending and making recommendations to amend soil years ago. And the it's called survival of the fittest. You know, if that tree is not going to make it, I want to know it right away. Yeah. So that I yeah. can put something else in there. I like Life's too that. short. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've been learning the more, the longer we homestead to roll with things that want to live here, roll the things with, that naturally work. It just is easier That's, for everybody. Yeah. It's an excellent approach. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Process. But, um, let's, I want to talk about food in containers. Do you grow, do much container gardening? Uh, that was, that was my specialty for almost oh, 15 years. Well, perfect. So, so yeah. I have not done a lot. I've done a little bit. And it's always offered, like in the homestead world, it's offered as a great alternative if you have, you know, minimal yard space, or you can't dig in your yard, or you have a, you're living in an apartment balcony. But I'll be really honest, when I have tried playing around with vegetables in pots, I've had mediocre results. So how do you how do you get over that hump? Is there a trick to growing productive food plants in pots? Well, yeah, you know, I I think a lot of it is timing, um, definitely timing, because you know, when you, when you talk about, you know, the, the exposure of a container as opposed to planting in the ground, a lot of the, a lot of the, the climate climactic influences that you're talking about, I mean, they really super influence a container, you know? So if you get a temperature drop, you're talking about it's, it's hitting the root system of the plant, not just the top of the plant. So that, that can have a lot to do with it, but you know, I, I mean, for instance, my ground's terrible for carrots. I have to grow carrots in containers. I mean, I have no other choice. I mean, we have such heavy clay. So the, the, the soil that I had to deal with here that I've actually been working with now for 12 years, um, this soil was used to make glass. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's it's silicon. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It, it's almost like talcum powder. It's yeah. so amazing. But it's it seizes up so much that... Carrots can't grow in it. So, yeah. and you know, things like lettuce is so easy to do in containers. I mean, that's, that's a simple one to do in containers. And now they have all these dwarf varieties of, you know, like the dwarf zooks and the dwarf cucumbers and even dwarf patio tomatoes. I don't know if they taste any good. The patio tomatoes are terrible, but I've done the dwarf cucumbers. They're pretty damn good. Okay. So yeah. they'll grow. So, do you, are you fertilizing them differently to help them in oh, the yeah. pots? Okay. How are you? Yeah. Doing you that? know, well, keep in mind that when you're growing anything in a container, I, I always liken it to like raising fish in a fish tank. You know, the, the fish are totally dependent on you in the fish tank. Well, that's the same way when you grow anything in a container, it's totally dependent on you. So I like to make sure that one, my soil mix, you know, has uh, larger particle sizes in it so that there's a lot of area for cation exchange so that when I put, you know, my good organic fertilizer on it, that that organic fertilizer is going to go down and it's going to stay in the in the um, in in the soil, not leach leach its way through like some conventional fertilizers do. So I don't like convention. I've never liked conventional fertilizers since probably the you know early '80s. I kind of went, that's it. I'm you know there's there's just not enough there's not enough um, synergy in conventional. Uh, chemical fertilizers and what I think needs, you know, uh, in the, um, what the, the ground or a container plant requires, you know, it's all about the soil. So yeah, you, you feed different. I'm, I'm big on, I'm big on, um, on fish emulsions and, and I like fish emulsion and seaweed mixes. You know, those are all, they're great for just regular fertilizing and, you know, depending on what the variety is, different, different, you know, different varieties of plants require a different amount of nutrient as well. You kind of get to get used to that. And in containers, you know, if you, if you put a little bit of fertilizer into the soil, when you're, you know, doing the soil, I always put a little bit of quarter inch pathway bark because potting soil is, I don't know, it's always lacking something. I, I, and then um, I, I, I tend to like more acidic based potting soils for, you know, growing vegetables and, and, and growing fruit trees in containers. I like acidic potting soils because most of these other potting soils are neutral. And, um, you know, a lot of vegetables and stuff like a little bit of, a, you know, of, of uh, an acid uh, mix. So, you know, in the pH somewhere around 6.5, I think, or 6 is, is pretty complementary to a lot of things. Okay, I think 
when I have done it, I think I've been skimping on the soil. I don't think I've been giving them enough to eat. And that's probably why, like I can get vegetable plants to, they won't die, but they don't really yeah. flourish. They just kind of stay yeah, they the don't same. Thrive. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to give them a lot of protection because like I said, that container, that container is incredibly vulnerable. So here, you know, it's not, it's not the cold, it's the heat. And those, you know, those containers can heat up to, I, I, that's why, you know, the whole nursery business and us in black pots, you know, and then, and then we wonder why, you know, our plants struggle in a black pot. Well, when it gets to be a hundred degrees here, that pot can heat up to 140 degrees inside. And it may not even cool down in the evening. I mean, just imagine the torture that roots going through. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I never thought of that part. It's yeah. getting like getting so hot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's not exclusive to California. I mean, um, there's plenty of places in the United States where summers get tremendously hot. And even with the humidity factor, like it's really great where summers get really hot and you've got high humidity. Plants really like that. They, they, they tend to do pretty good in that other than some of the diseases become more prevalent. But the fact is, is that the container though, that root system is going to heat up to that out side ambient temp whatever that temperature is and cooling down in the evening unless it cools down dramatically that plant may very well go into the next day with that container being at 100 degrees and we used to do tests in the nursery just to be able to say you know what's the best pot for a, a part of container growing is also exploring pots and what do you think we came up with as the best pot for growing uh generally growing anything in terracotta Nah, no, terracotta no. was the worst. It's the worst. Oh, good. I'm doing. I'm doing good. I have no idea. Something not black, I guess. <laughs> it was no, not, not black, black, but plastic. Okay, just plastic. One because plastic was because we're, it's reusable. Okay. Number two is because it cools down pretty quickly in the evening. Now you know that temperature comes down, it cools down. You know as well. Wood is the best, but it's the least sustainable. You know, and it's the most expensive. So you know, it's not really practical. And uh, terracotta, you know, just think about brick ovens. I'm just thinking of that. It does. It's not going to cool off. Is it? It's going to hold that. And, and yeah. No, and it's very porous. So it, a lot of times it wicks water. It will wick water out the top if it's if it's not completely glazed and the top is you know open. Then it wicks water out of the top. So it's actually taking you know the, the that precious moisture out. So that's a lot of problems. I don't do terracotta anything. Okay. But it's prettier than plastic. <laughs> It is, it is beautiful. And that's the reason why it sells, you know, yeah, but you yeah. know, if you're going to have to use terracotta, you want to make sure that it gets the pot is protected from the afternoon sun. Yeah. You okay. know, you really want the pot to start cooling down before, you know, the um, hot blazing afternoon sun starts hitting it because if it, you know, if it's 140 degrees at six o'clock at night, seven o'clock at night, is it going to cool down 60 degrees overnight? Probably not. And then you'll have a pretty yeah. pot and a dead plant, which isn't. Well, or, or you have a pretty pot and a struggling plant. It really never does because that, you know, that's to your point where, you know, you get that plant that's not quite doing it. Why isn't it doing it? It's not always just food. It may very well be just the fact that that pot's overexposed to whatever that element, the elements may be. Sure. Yeah. No, that, that totally makes sense. So speaking of pots, talk to me. I think we've talked about this before on a live a long time ago. Citrus. Citrus yeah. and pots for people like me who there's no way on God's green earth I can grow citrus outside ever. What, right. what are my options? I, and I think you've told me this before, and I have to confess I killed the lemon tree that you guys sent me. Shame on you. I know it was very <laughs> sad, and it, I actually was being very careful, but I I was putting it in and out of the house, and I was following all the rules, and then a hailstorm came through one day. <laughs> It was just like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And I was running around getting everything else covered. And then I was like, the lemon tree. And it was not good. It's not good. So. Well, look, at my, my cousin, we sent my cousin a lemon tree um, about 10 years ago in Connecticut. And he's still got it. He, awesome. and, and, and ironically, <clears throat> he never took it out of the plant, the pot he's got it in. So he's keeping it alive in the pot that he got it 10 years ago in. Okay. You know, I don't recommend that, yeah. but he's he's has a certain horticultural sense to him. So that plant is almost, you know, might as well be hydroponically grown right now. It's totally dependent on him to provide food regularly. Yeah. And he knows how to do that. He's a hydroponic dude. Oh, okay. So he, he's, got, he's got that down. 
But I, I, I can tell you, citrus loves containers. If there's any one plant that actually is ideal for container growing, it is citrus and blueberries, both. Oh, Those are good. two of the them. best plants for, for container growing. Okay. Absolutely. And both of them actually require similar types of environments. Citrus likes an acid potting mix. It likes, likes an acid soil. So it'll tolerate a six. It'll, you know, it'll tolerate even down into the fives, you know, say down to about five, eight citrus will do fine. Um, blueberries love five, eight, you know, they want five, eight down to five, five for blueberries. So if you've got soil that isn't complementary to, to growing blueberries and you're having trouble, man, blueberries in a pot are, are a cinch and that, in California, that's all I recommend. I don't recommend you even try blueberries in ground. Grow them in, con in containers. They're Sweet. beautiful. So if I did that here, would I just bring them inside? No, like in the winter? Or what would I do with yeah. them? Yeah, yeah you'd have to, you got to protect that container okay. yeah. during the winter. You know, that's your, that's your big, you know, what do you want to call it? Your exposure is in the container during the wintertime because that root will freeze solid, you know. So you just got to bring, you can bring them into a garage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you don't blue, do blue. How, how's your ground? Can you dig a hole there? Yeah, we have, I mean, we have some clay. We're ha definitely more on the clay end of things, but our soil under the native prairie grass is pretty decent. Like it's, it's nice soil. It can be really good. Very cool. I don't know well, if we're quite acidic enough for blueberries naturally, but. That's the next question. Yeah. That was the next question. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and that's the problem in California is that, I mean, our water's pH here runs eight eight, nine, you know, yeah. so people will go, yeah, I did everything. And, you know, and man, it just never seems to do anything. And say, do you have to check your pH of water? And I go, oh yeah, it's eight, five. So yeah. well, every time you water, that's countering, you know, the requirement for that plant's environment. But when you do it in containers, you can create the perfect potting mix. So you mix your peat in there, you mix some peat in there, you mix some core, that C O I R core yeah. is excellent stuff, man. I love it. Okay. And uh, you mix and chunk core. You want chunk. You don't want shredded. You get chunk core. Mix that in, and then you have your acid potting mix. And um, then you feed it. You know, I feed I feed my blueberries uh, um, fresh uh, organic acid food about four times a year. Okay. I just give it a little bit. You know, yeah. just uh, yeah. you know, maybe a half a cup something like that. But I've got blueberries that are actually in 20, uh, 21 inch containers. They're big containers. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Full, full size blueberry plants. And they're like good yield. Like you're getting lots. Oh of yeah. Them. Great yield. That, yeah. Okay. I'm doing great. This. I am totally doing this. I'm right. I'm taking great notes. yields. And, and all I'd recommend for your area is that you probably stick to the northerns, you know, stick okay. to the Northern high bush. Okay. Don't, don't do the southerns. Yeah, there, but there's lots of great northerns, man. I mean, for, as far as flavor is concerned, northern high bush, there's some tremendously flavored northern high bush. You, you can't yeah. go wrong. Okay. So I could yeah. leave them outside and then maybe I could put them in my greenhouse during the fall when the weather starts to get a little iffy and then maybe bring them in the house or the garage when it gets super cold. Because the greenhouse still gets pretty cold right now. We're not heated. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, some people's garages, depending on where you live too, can get pretty dang cold too. We have a semi-heated so, shop. I think it doesn't freeze in there. It doesn't get hot, but it, it doesn't perfect. freeze. Perfect. So. That's great. I yeah. I mean, okay. if it gets down, let's say it gets down into the high twenties, you're fine. Okay. You know, okay. high to mid twenties, you're fine. Blueberries can tolerate that. Okay. Even, even the Southerns can tolerate that, but it's, it's when you get down into the, you know, the teens and below, that root system freezes. And once that root system freezes, that's it. All bets are off. You're going to, you know, the chances are, odds are you're going to lose that plant. Yeah. No, that, that makes yeah. sense. And we, I mean, we For had like container. 30 below wind chill at one point this winter. So blueberries, there go. not friendly to the blueberries. They don't like that. Yeah. Cane so. berries do well. You know, you can do cane berries in containers too. They do tremendous. They're great. But citrus is probably, you know, I think if you think about, you know, in Europe, and all the citrus that came into the Europe, you know, into Europe during the 1700s, you know, and the beautiful greenhouses that they built for them, and they put them outside during the summertime. I mean, we were in Italy just before COVID, and the, these beautiful hundred-year-old citrus plants in containers are there. Bobley Gardens was a place that I, I jumped the fence and went into the greenhouse <laughs> because they had put them all away. Oh my word! Oh my yeah. word! And I just. 
I was trying to be right about it, but yeah. nobody was there. So I went, just, I got to see these. Gotta see them, yeah. <laughs> I'm only here picture. right now. Yep. That's it. I, I figured, yeah. you know, like I just give them my business card if, you know, they caught me. Sure. And nobody sure. caught me. It was really, it was really cool. <laughs> and Ed gets arrested in Europe. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sneaking into the glass house at Bodley yep. Gardens. Yeah. <laughs> so that would be a good story. I would. Oh, story. yeah. No, I, it'd be right up my alley. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm feeling inspired on the blueberries because I've just always ruled them out pretty much. I just kind of ignored them because I didn't. Oh, no. Blueberries. It, so. Blueberries okay. are great. I okay. mean, you know, they, they're just they're one of my favorite foods. You know, they, the um, I started looking at blueberries about the time a lot of the reports on, you know, the um, power of antioxidants and, you know, started to come out in the mid 90s, early 90s, in, you know, early to mid 90s. You know, there were some studies that came out of Europe. Then there was one that came out of the United States. And all of them said, blueberries, yeah. that's it. You yeah. know, that's the superfood. And then all these superfoods. The other one that came out of it was pomegranate. So I spent a lot of time researching pomegranates and looking at all the different varieties that come out of Turkmenistan and out of uh, Iran. And, you know, spent a lot of time with pomegranates. Pomegranates are, are you know, that's another one of my yeah. favorite fruits. Yep. That's a yeah, good one. Excellent stuff. Yeah. Really good for you. I think they call isn't pomegranate a superfood? Or I don't know, they change their definition of superfood yes. all the time. But oh, it, yeah. I think it's in the, on the list. Yeah. It yeah. is on yeah, it's a superfood. Sure. You know, prunes are on this uh, on the uh, are a superfood. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but prunes are coming back into fashion. So back. it yeah, it seems like the is it the Gen Ys? The Gen the is it Gen Ys or Gen Z? I can't keep track of the the Y Z X. I, I don't know. Yeah, After yeah, millennials, yeah. I mean, I'm like, I don't know. They're all the, they feel all the same. <laughs> yeah. Well, even the even the millennials now are getting the handshake for their gardening. They seem to be moving towards gardening. They are. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the Gen okay. Ys and stuff, they they don't have a lot of the stigma that we used that word earlier. Yeah. Stigmas are attached to food like we did. You know, prunes are for old people. Yeah. Well, I'm an old people. I eat prunes, but I've yeah. eaten prunes all my life. So, I mean, yeah. I... I almost don't like the name prune anymore. I want to call them something like European plum. We need to rebrand <laughs> them. We should. We, we just. They just need a rebranding. Then they'd be fine. <laughs> there's, be okay. there's a there's a germplasm repository here at UC Davis, and it's called the Wolf Skill Germplasm Repository. And if you're a history nut, that is tremendous. There's a tremendous amount of history around that whole place. But uh, there's this huge prune. Um, uh, hybridization program that's going on there. And boy, you can have a lot of fun going through and going, wow, that's a prune. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Yep. And it does sound riveting. I would like a prune smoothie yes. right now. <laughs> that could be a thing. I could see that. We got the avocado oh, toast could. and the prune smoothies. I mean, without a doubt. Happen. Without, we did um, on the Tomorrow's Harvest, we have a the Tomorrow's Harvest. Um, uh, um, Twitter, uh, not Twitter. Oh, God, I can't think. Instagram. Uh, Instagram. Instagram. Okay. Tomorrow's, Tomorrow's Harvest Instagram, Instagram page and a Tomorrow's Harvest uh, Facebook page. And on the Tomorrow's Harvest Instagram page and Facebook page, we did a four part series on pomegranates with um, one of my colleagues at, um, at Virtual Nursery. And um, it, we just talked about what some of the, even some of the varieties that I had the privilege of naming because I reintroduced a lot of these varieties that had kind of really squirrely names and I didn't think anybody would ever buy into them. So we, we just kind of had fun and just gave them all new names. Hey, yeah, this is called pink satin. How yeah, do you like, like that? It. Yeah. It'll live forever. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> well, Ed, I think we've gone slightly over the time I told you. So hopefully we're, I'm not monopolizing the rest of your afternoon, but this was, no, no, you're not. This was, Let me see what the, Oh no, it's cool. Yeah. It's this fine. was fantastic. Like this was so enlightening and I learned a ton. I know the audience learned a ton. Where can people go to find out more? I know you just mentioned tomorrow's harvest. Is that the best place for them to go? connect with well, you to, and your yeah tomorrow's tomorrow's harvest is uh, is our retail website and it has a tremendous amount of fruit on it and and new and exciting varieties it it's kind of like my years with dave wilson nursery i did a lot of introductions of new fruits and and now with virtual nursery i'm doing the same thing with a whole new collection of fruit and some exciting varieties but like the donut peaches and donut nectarines 
that there's a whole slew of these that I've found that are absolutely outstanding. I just don't know how they're zoned yet. So I can't say uh, you should try yeah. one of these, Joe. Uh, probably I'm <laughs> guessing I don't count in the list. I never I never I get to do almost, the cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know what? Here's what I'd recommend though too, just just as a side note, keep those trees your trees need to be really short. Oh, okay. You need to take them out of the wind. Okay. That's a good take point. Out, yes. You bet. Okay. You know like like I was like I'll give you an example. I grew Santa Rosa plums and kept them 40 inches tall for close to 15 years. Okay. Never, ever did I get anything less than maybe 150 pieces of fruit off of them a year. Wow. Never. That's amazing. Okay. And, and the whole test, the whole test was to see, can I keep a tree that tall or how long can I keep a tree that tall? And, and is it worth keeping a tree that tall because it gives you fruit? It's yeah. productive. Yeah. The answer is yes. And yes. Okay. So keep trees short. Keep them short. You have a whole new experiment you need to do. Uh, well, I'm going to end up Googling how to prune apple trees. So. Well, I actually show you how to do that on uh, Edible oh. Solutions. I, I, have, I have pruning okay. videos from my backyard. I show you how to keep trees low. Okay. But uh, And Tomorrow's Harvest is is also on Facebook and on, on Instagram with um, lots of how-to stuff as well. But mainly it's talking about all the different wonderful varieties of fruit and giving you just a little bit of exposure to them. And then also mm, I have to admit some video fun. I mean, God, isn't it great? We all get to be videologists now. We, we do. Yes. Yes. Talk about I learning curves. Uh, yes. I think it's great. I'm <laughs> yeah. having a ball. Yeah. Sometimes Good. I'm having a ball and people go, man, Ed, come on, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them, no, I will keep, keep doing your thing. Keep doing your thing. Don't slow down. Thank so. you. I won't. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So guys, go to tomorrowsharvest.com to shop for trees for your new edible landscaping project. And then go to Edible Absolutely. Solutions on Facebook to go connect with Ed and see what he's doing in his yard. Um, yep. Yep. Any other last bits of advice for the listeners who might be ready to dive into this new world? No, you know what? I, t I, I tell you what, I, I really appreciate the casual conversation that we've had. I, I, I got to tell you, because most of the time, you know, these these can be pretty stuffy. Oh and yeah, this has been very yeah. very kind. We'll I like stuffy. that. <laughs> yeah. no, My no, audience no, won't want to buy it by stuffy. So. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Yeah. I I'm not really into that as well. I, I as well. I tend to have a little bit more casual approach to things. So yeah, I good. can be stuffy if you'd like. Nah, but nah, it's not, good. Not no, and I think it's good because I mean I think when we hear the term orchardist or horticulturist, I think. Our, my brain instantly thinks of like someone stogy behind a desk at a university. So I think having someone like you who's accessible and able to talk about it and bring it into a real world application is really important for people, you know, looking into growing more food and becoming more self-reliant. So it's important. And, and people like myself love to share. I mean, that's, you know, the, the, the reason we get all this experience is simply because we love to do it. That exposure, then what do you do with it after you've, you know, done it in your own yard you want to share it with people and have them you know of course experience that kind of joy as well absolutely well said that's a good place to end it thank you so much <laughs> that's my pleasure thank you